uh, and it's regarding uh, the teaching that prophecy doesn't need to be accurate today. It's very prevalent, very widespread. Uh, the NAR, New Apostolic Reformation, claims that prophecy doesn't need to be accurate today. In fact, they've developed a whole set of arguments to support this, and it's become part of their standard doctrinal package. So some might ask, well, what's the NAR? What's the New Apostolic Reformation? Well, um, it is basically where hyper charismatic, uh, the hyper charismatic world has gone. It is where it's at right now. Um, it's closely linked with the Toronto Blessing. All its leaders experienced or were in the Toronto Blessing approve of it. And, uh, <clears throat> but uh, what, the NA, what the New Apostolic Reformation is basically is that God has restored apostles and prophets today as they were in the New Testament times. The churches should align, as they say, align, come underneath them and uh, come underneath their authority. And they will help strategize and engineer a second Pentecost that will completely outdo the first Pentecost. Mm -hmm. It will make the first Pentecost pale in Clark. comparison. And then it will, uh, there will be a worldwide revival and uh, we will conquer Blood. the dominion of Satan and uh, and uh, take over his kingdom and hand it over to Christ. We will basically prepare everything for Christ to come. That is all part of the NAR. People who are leading it are people like Bill Johnson, Cheyan, Heidi Baker, Rick Joyner. Um, there's so many names. I've, gave, I've given a whole talk about this uh, last year, and uh, you can ask for the recordings. Now, uh, there is an Israeli organization that is the main perpetrator of NAR teachings. It's called Tikkun, T I K U N. They are the main NAR organization here in Israel. They promote basically all the NAR doctrines including the one that I'm going to teach today. I was asked for an update. What's the state on NAR here in Israel? Well, they're making bolder claims. And last time that we, that I came to, um, to England, I said that Messianic leaders in Israel were looking into this. And they appointed a subcommittee of five pastors to examine the teachings of this group. Tikkun specifically, they wrote a report which was not very favorable, to say the least. Um, and decision regarding it has been postponed again and again, and then Corona hit. Uh, so right now, decision regarding what we do with Tikkun and with the NAR in Israel uh, is postponed to September. Uh, and I don't know if it will be postponed yet again. In any case, I have been working very strongly against the NAR movement in Israel. So uh, what, are, what are we dealing with in this teaching? What are the basic claims and quotes that they are making about inaccuracy? Okay, um, to give you an example, a great prophet in the NAR called Bob Jones, said that we can expect the accuracy of up to about 65% from modern day prophets today, but this will improve over time and in the future we will be able to expect accuracy of 95%. Mike Bickle makes similar statements of 
saying most um, prophecies that he hears are, are trash. Um, but that doesn't mean that the per person was not really prophesying or under an unction. Um, this is the mood in, in the NAR. This is the teaching, this is the thought. You can prophesy under inspiration of the Holy Spirit and yet be wrong, and that's okay. If you expect accuracy in prophecy and you say, hang on, no. If you were prophesying in the Spirit, then it should be accurate. Things should come to pass. Uh, then they ridicule you. They say it's old school thinking. You don't know anything about the prophetic. These are the kind of things that you hear. One of the leaders of this teaching is called Chris Vallotton. He says, I know many people who have prophesied falsely for 30 years. It doesn't mean they're false prophets, just bad prophets. You see, they're trying to uh, to okay inaccurate prophecy. He says, I don't know anyone uh, who always got it right. The scriptures don't give you the privilege of getting it right all the time. This is the kind of thought that they bring. So expecting accuracy in prophecy is associated with a religious spirit. This is the normal thing. If you don't go by what their apostles and prophets are currently saying, you have a religious spirit. Okay? If you stick to your Bible, you have a religious spirit. While non-accuracy is viewed in a positive light, because it shows God to be gracious and easygoing, not strict and harsh like you portray him. This is the thought. This is the background. Who is leading this teaching? Basically, all the NAR. This is across the NAR. But I think that it's coming especially from Bethel Church that, that does Bethel music. Uh, Bill Johnson, their apostle, and he's one of the lead apostles of the NAR. And another two younger teachers called Sean Boltz and Chris Vallotton. They're both either in Bethel or Bethel associated. So Bethel in Redding, California, set the tone for the NAR movement. They've been, it's like Toronto was for the Toronto Blessing. Bethel Redding is for uh, the NAR movement. They are now setting the tone throughout uh, the charismatic or hyper-charismatic movement, and they are extremely influ influential and very successful. Tikkun in Israel, the main NAR organization, is uh, they, they basically pick up the Bethel teachings and relay them here in Israel. Now, what caused this thing to surface or to resurface this teaching? I think that Corona outbreak caught all their modern so-called prophets by surprise. And uh, as, as, as did 9-11 and Y2K, they couldn't predict it. In fact, they were prophesying almost unanimously good things for 2020. This is their custom. They give a prophecy for the next year. The word of the Lord for 2020, the word of the Lord for whatever. And they were all saying good things, apart from maybe one or two who were saying there will be a crisis, which is very generic. Crisis could be a liberal judge appointed in the high court, you know what I mean? The crisis could be many things. It could be war in the Balkans, you know? They were all prophesying good things. And it came to a peak when Kenneth Copeland was prophesying the end of, first of all, he couldn't foretell that the disease would come. He couldn't warn anyone. When it came and he couldn't even hold a meeting uh, with, with all his congregants, so he declared it would be over 
at the 20 on the 29th day of March 2020 at 12 o'clock noon and Corona is still there so then he declared a heat wave I mean he made whole ceremonies declaring and whatever he declared a heat wave to come all over America and destroy Corona and then there was a temperature drop cold winds uh, the exact opposite of what he was prophesying and declaring so all of this made a kind of a crisis in the NAR hyper charismatic world thinking well what's going on why aren't our prophets getting it right this is what brought this subject of uh, can you be inaccurate and still be a prophet of God to the surface so before we go into the teaching I'd just like to look at the standard of prophecy according to the Bible it says the prophet who one presumes to speak a word in my name which I have not commanded him to speak or who and that is point number two speaks in the name of other gods that prophet shall die that was the commandment in the Old Testament verse 22 that's Deuteronomy 18 when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord if the thing does not happen or come to pass that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken the prophet has spoken it presumptuously you shall not be afraid of him and this thing you shall not be afraid of him is very important because these people can carry an air of authority or you're afraid to speak against them they say things like touch not the Lord's anointed so you're afraid to say anything against them and say that was a false prophecy because then you might experience a demonic attack the Lord will remove his blessing because the one the apostle that you're under has removed his covering from you or whatever these these are the kind of scare tactics so we'll examine this teaching of you don't need to be accurate uh, you I'm sure that you will come across it if you haven't already uh, we'll examine a few claims for instance the standard of New Testament prophecy is lower than the Old Testament standard so it needn't be accurate prophecy needn't be accurate that is one of them this is the main claim they say we don't stone people today for prophesying falsely as in the Old Testament from this they gather that um, you know if you were stoned for something in the Old Testament and in the New Testament you're not stoned for it then obviously the standard has become lower hasn't it so not getting it right is okay another thing that they say is that they have this notion that prophecy has been spread out from a few accurate prophets to many non-accurate prophets in the church and they refer to verses like you can all prophesy and this includes toddlers now you've heard it right your sons and daughters shall prophesy and out of the mouths of babes and sucklings etc so I've read accounts of people saying oh my three-year-old toddler just prophesied to me he's he said this and he said that he had a word of knowledge and whatever they don't seem to be concerned at all that someone receives the gift uh, of the Holy Spirit when he believes he is then born again and the Holy Spirit decides which gifts to give him uh, they don't seem to care about that too much it's just oh my toddler prophesied well is he saved uh, okay that's a that's a whole story but that's what they're saying another thing that they base it on is the verse from 1st Corinthians 13 they say for we know in part that's verse 9 we know in part and we prophesy in part verse 12 for now we see in a mirror dimly this means that 
you know, you only know part, so you don't need to be accurate. They also say prophecy needs to be judged, which is true. Prophecy needs to be judged. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. Uh, so from this they conclude you don't need to be accurate because if you're accurate, why should people judge? It shows that the, old, that the New Testament standard of prophecy is lower. Uh, and here's an example. Uh, they also use First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 20 and 21. Do not despise the prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast uh, what is good. From this they say, if you've prophesied wrongly, so the prophecy needs to be tested. And then you take from that prophecy those parts that helped you. So say someone said a whole lot of things, maybe said ten things. And three of them you found true or helpful. So then you hold fast to these and you reject what was bad. See, prophecy can be inaccurate. Asher in Traitor is <clears throat> one of the lead apostles, maybe, maybe the leading apostle, so-called apostle, in Israel. Uh, he is the president of Tikkun organization, who are increasingly influential in the international scene and NAR. In an in a article of his, We Prophesy in Part, published in 2018, he says, if, every prophet, if, every, if everything prophetic was perfect and complete, there would be no need to hold on to what is good and reject what is not. You are to hold on to what is good and reject the bad. This is their explanation. And uh, one of the leaders of the whole movement, Bill Johnson, and Bill Johnson, I think, is a dangerous false teacher. And I don't say that about every false teacher. Bill Johnson says, eat the meat and spit out the bones. You received a prophecy. Some of it is good. Some of it is wrong. Just take what's good. What's your problem? That is the, the attitude. That's the teaching. So we're going to try and give some answers to this. In 1 Corinthians 13, 9, where it says, we know in part and we prophesy in part, for now we see in a mirror dimly. This is comparing our partial knowledge now with the full knowledge we'll have when we see Christ face to face. In verse 12, we read, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as also just as I also am known. It's comparing the partial knowledge now to the full knowledge when Christ is here. This is partial knowledge, not inaccurate knowledge. There is nothing here that justifies mistaken prophecies. And this is important. If you read it and you never thought that it would justify uh, inaccurate prophecies, you're right. It doesn't. All the Bible prophets, they had partial knowledge. Okay, they didn't all receive everything. The whole council. It, the, the knowledge was built incrementally. And uh, none of them were mistaken. Every prophecy that they received and delivered was perfect in itself. You don't have to sift through Isaiah or Jeremiah and try and find the 80% that's right and the 20% that's wrong. No. They all had partial but perfect knowledge. This was always the case. When they say prophecy has been spread out to many, this assumes that there's a limited amount. This assumes that there's a limited amount 
of um, of accuracy available that needs to be spread out if you had one profit you had 100 percent accuracy now you have five profits so they each have 20 percent accuracy that's that's a completely wrong assumption nothing in the scriptures supports this notion it stems from a limited view of god and in the nar there is a limited view of god this this is another subject in itself first corinthians 14 31 says for you can all prophesy one by one. This is intended to keep order. In the same chapter, it says, let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. Two or three prophets speak, let the others judge. Why judge? Because they always needed to be judged. Any prophet in the Old or New Testament had you had to weigh their words and see if it was truly from God, if it came to pass, if it accorded with scripture. Regarding children prophesying, we don't have a single instance of toddlers prophesying in the Bible. And of course, it doesn't say your sons and daughters shall prophesy mistakenly. It says your sons and daughters will prophesy. The standards in Deuteronomy 18, they show us that the standards that we showed before. They show us that prophets in the Old Testament too needed to be judged by them, by these standards. When it says test all things and hold fast which is good, it means that you reject wrong prophecies and hold fast to true prophecies. It doesn't mean you take the good from a mixed prophecy, a mixed good and bad prophecy. God doesn't give you mixed prophecies and then expects you to start filtering the good from the bad. This doesn't give you much confidence in God, in prophecy, and in prophets. It's written, the word of the Lord, the words of the Lord are pure words, like silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Okay? When God gives a word, it's not a mixed prophecy that arrives with you. And now you have to start filtering good from bad. It's tried seven times. So if it's true, it's true. And if it's not true, if part of it is not true, then it's not true and has to be completely rejected. This is God's instructions in Jeremiah. Reject those who are prophesying falsely. And what about there's no stoning today? that argument well there's no stoning today well here's the question do we stone adulterers and homosexuals today no so maybe adultery and homosexuality are okay today definitely not the moral standards have not been reduced at all you can't conclude from there being no Stoning in the New Testament, which is not a theocracy situation like in Old Testament Israel, that now the standard of prophecy has been lowered because then you'd have to conclude that uh, the standard of morality has been lowered when the opposite is, is true. The standard of morality has been raised in the New Testament. So it's an empty argument. When people say, well, you don't stone them today, that's an, that's an empty argument. The church doesn't stone people, period. And all of these things, they strike at the very nature of prophecy. Look at the nature of prophecy, Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. I am God, 
and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Isaiah 48, I have declared the former things from the beginning. God foretells accurately, through his prophets, of course. They went forth from my mouth and I caused them to hear it. Suddenly I did them and they came to pass. So if hearing something like prophecy needn't be accurate sounds weird to you, you're absolutely right. Saying you don't need accuracy in, proph in prophecy is striking at the heart of prophecy. It's an attack on the very nature. It's an attack on the heart of prophecy, what prophecy is. Today in the morning, I told my kids, there are those who teach. They asked, what are you going to teach about? I said, well, there are those who teach that you don't need to be accurate in prophecy. If you said something and it doesn't come to pass, it doesn't mean you're not a prophet. And they, they said, but, but what, that's the whole thing about prophecy. That's the whole point. And yes, a little child can understand that. So that's the first argument, that prophecy doesn't need to be accurate. And there's another one that they supply to try and help that. Agabus made mistakes. That's a common argument among those who teach you don't need to be accurate. And while, uh, <laughs> while researching this thing, I found an article called throwing prophecy under the agabus <laughs> so apparently someone was addressing this issue uh, also in an article and i thought that was a very smart way of putting it they're throwing prophecy under the agabus their basic claim is this agabus didn't get all the details right in his prophecies for instance the Jews were not the ones to bind Paul, as Agabus said, but the Romans did. And the Jews didn't hand Paul over to the Gentiles, rather the Gentiles, or Romans, handed him to the Jews. Yet Agabus was not condemned as a false prophet, so it's okay to get things wrong. New Testament prophecy can be inspired, yet fallible. This is the essence of their argument. Now let's look at what is written in Acts 21. This is Agabus's prophecy. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, that's Agabus, bound his own hands and feet and said, thus, the Holy Spirit, thus says the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Then we read in verse 30, and all the city was disturbed, and the people, that is the Jews, ran together, seized Paul, and dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. And when they, that means the Jews, saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains. So we can safely assume that they bound Paul somehow to take him out by force. Without Luke having to record the fulfillment of every detail. If you did this scrutiny to every prophecy in the Old Testament and found that not every detail was recorded in its fulfillment and then assumed that it didn't happen, then you just cut out a whole lot of profits. We can't prove that he was wrong. So this is an argument from absence. Just because Luke didn't record the, de the, the detail, every detail of it being fulfilled, you can't argue from that that there, he got it wrong. 
Such interpretation is clearly nitpicking to try and find fault. It's simply wrong to assume Agabus's prophecy was not fulfilled accurately just because Luke didn't mention every detail. And another thing is, Agabus said, thus says the Holy Spirit, Agabus would be guilty of the sin of presumption by saying this had not been fulfilled. If people say it wasn't fulfilled and he said, thus says the Holy Spirit, that's the sin of presumption. That's an accusation against a proven prophet. Paul's summary was this in Acts 28, men and brethren, he summarizes it this way, men and brethren, though I have done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. So yes, he was bound and handed over to the Gentiles. Agabus is an example of accuracy in prophecy, not the opposite. When the Jews were dragging Paul out, we can only assume they used some makeshift thing, maybe some belt or some string or whatever to bind him and take him out. They didn't ask him politely, would you come outside with us? There was force. And Agabus prophesied rightly, and it was fulfilled. The NAR can only wish that they could prophesy as accurately as Agabus did. He didn't make any mistakes. He prophesied a famine in Acts 11, and it happened. He's a proven prophet. And he prophesied Paul's arrest and delivery to the Gentiles in Acts 21, and that happened too. So this is regarding the Agabus also got it wrong argument of this to justify inaccurate prophecies. Another argument that they use is there were schools of prophets. They make a big deal out, out of this. There were schools of prophets. I'll explain. They say this, if there were schools of prophets, this means they were learning to prophesy in that school. We're all growing in the prophetic. This is a term that they use. We're all growing in the prophetic. As time goes by, your words will bear more authority and will carry more weight. You'll grow in accuracy. One of the administrators in Tikkun, I think he's the media, head of media in the Tikkun organization, he points to two of their prophets in their ministry and he says they're growing in accuracy. They have been growing in accuracy over time. This is a common thought among the NAR people. And here's the answer. There is no school of prophets in Hebrew. There's a band the word used there is a band, a band of prophets. It doesn't imply schooling, the, that specific word, it just means a band. Another thing is that we're not told they learned how to prophesy or grow in the prophetic. We're just not told that, that's an assumption from nothing. They didn't teach how to improve your predictions over time, as it is taught in the NAR. They teach you to try and improve your predictions over time. We're not taught that that happened. There is no teaching in the scripture on how to learn to hear the voice of God, as is often said. When God wants to tell you something, it's clear. He knows how to tell you without techniques of learning how to hear the voice of God. You don't learn to prophesy and you don't develop the gift of prophecy. You either have it or you don't. You either received a prophecy 
or you didn't. It's not something that grows on you. You can learn to make better use of a gift. That you can. For instance, teaching. You can learn the scriptures better. That would improve your gift of teaching. And you can improve how to deliver uh, the, your teaching in a better way, in a more understandable way. But when you have the gift of teaching, it's, then you just have it. It's a gift from the Holy Spirit. So there are ways in which you can make better use of a gift and learn to do that. You can neglect your spiritual gift. But there's no basis for, for increasing the gift of prophecy and tongues and miracles and things like that. You either got it or you don't. You don't grow in the prophetic. And someone might ask, why were there bands? And the answer is discipling and fellowship. Joshua was discipled. Elisha was discipled, the apostles were discipled. Discipling was common and should be common. The people of God wanted to be close together, to be with those who feared the Lord and to be close to God's prophet and hear God's word. That's all we can really assume. We can't assume that they were learning how to prophesy. And another thing they're saying, that they're growing in the prophetic. And that's really a question. Are they growing in the prophetic? Because all of their mature prophets get it time, they get things wrong time and again. They fail miserably in their prophecies. Uh, and they can't point to any single prophet and say he's got a track record of getting things accurately. Uh, Kenneth Copeland has been in ministry for maybe five decades. He fails miserably in both doctrine and fulfillment. Bob Jones is considered one of their, he's, they consider him a, like a super prophet. He got a host of things wrong. He even prophesied on, on my mother and my mom told me what he said was complete nonsense. It didn't come to pass. And he prophesied on Todd Bentley. Uh, all sorts of great things. And then Todd Bentley had his various affairs. Chuck Pierce is considered one of their most mature prophets. He couldn't prophesy the corona. Uh, and he got things wrong. The Kansas City prophets got things wrong. They couldn't even tell that they had two sexually immoral people between them. It's... They don't have a record. You can't see like young prophets getting it wrong sometimes, but the mature prophets getting it right. There's no such thing in the NAR movement. And I'll just briefly mention another argument or two. They say that the prophets of Jeremiah's time who were prophesying peace and safety were not false prophets. They just missed it. You see, you see what they're trying to do here. They're trying to justify it when one of their prophets makes it wrong. So they're actually going to the lengths of saying that the other prophets in Jeremiah's time who were saying the exact opposite of him were true prophets who were just missing it. They weren't false prophets. I deal with this at length. Uh, I will deal with it at length in the next video that I'll be releasing. Watch out for Now Watch Israel YouTube channel and look for my <clears throat> next video regarding this. And another argument they make is Ahab's 400 prophets who said that you'd have a wonderful victory. They weren't false prophets. They were just compromised. It's, it's terrible what's going on there. I mean, Jezebel, she killed all the true prophets. Ahab only had left those who would tell him what he wanted to hear. The only true prophet, Micaiah, was in jail. Uh, and he's the only one who did say, Ahab, you're going to lose this war. Uh, you, you might want to read the, the story of, of uh, Elijah 
and uh, Ahab and Micaiah to get all the details. But look how far they are going. They're looking for false prophets and saying they weren't false prophets, all to justify their false doctrines. The question is, why are they doing this? Why are they twisting the scriptures like this? And the answer is pretty simple. Because they always prophesy wrongly and they need a theology to back it up. None of them are prophets. None of these people that they're um, promoting as prophets are really prophets. And I'd even go as far as saying they don't even have the gift of prophecy. But also uh, open theism plays a part. Open theism is the theology that God doesn't really know everything. He leaves some things open. And he takes risks. He kind of opens things up for, you know, he kind of wants to see himself what, what will happen. And he's kind of figuring out things himself. This is called open theism. And uh, the one who initiated the NAR in its current form is Peter Wagner. See Peter Wagner. Uh, he was an open theist. You might have heard of open theism. You might have heard of John Eldridge's book, Wild at Heart. He, he portrays God as a risk taker. It's not like God to cover all his bases. Things like that. And Asherin Traitor. Here's a quote from his, the first edition of his book, Alignment. It's not his first book, but it's the first edition of that book. He says, God already knows almost everything. Notice the almost. Actually, he has on purpose given us an area of free will so that we can surprise him a bit. This is all open theism. God took a risk with Adam and Eve. He wanted to see what they will do. And then they sinned and he's, oh my goodness. This is the open theistic teaching. So if God doesn't know everything, how can his prophets know everything? It's somehow bound together, this open theism teaching and the inaccuracy and prophecy teaching. It's somehow all bound together. I'll move to my conclusions before we have the questions and answers. If you believe in, an, in inaccurate prophecies, it stems from perceiving God as weak and incapable of getting his message, his message across to his prophets accurately. It weakens your faith in God's ability and reliability. Second, uh, inaccurate Prophecy reduces prophecy to guesswork and trying your best at making predictions. Takes away from God's glory and it, it just makes prophecy non-prophecy. But believing in accuracy of prophecy stems from belief in an omnipotent and omniscient God who is able and does indeed communicate his word to us accurately through holy men of God, that is, through his prophets. So I would uh, beckon you all to maintain your faith in God's accuracy and reliability. He is trustworthy and his word is trustworthy. In 2 Peter uh, chapter 1 we read, we know this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. 2 Timothy 3, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction yeah. in righteousness. That the man of God right, may be you. complete, 
thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is, uh, this is what we learn about this doctrine of inaccurate prophecies. And, uh, and I'm open for questions. Brothers and sisters, please feel free. 